Hola. My name is Claudia Romo Edelman, and I'm delighted to be your co-host for este podcast a la Latina. I'm Cynthia kleinbaum Milner, and I'm delighted to be with you. In this episode, we're going to be learning about three main things. Number one, how to be your authentic self, how to recognize if your corporate environment is going to be allowing you to be yourself, and if not, how to walk out. You will also get tips and tricks on how to get noticed and how to get promoted to climb the corporate ladder. And number three, we're going to learn and get deeper into understanding the cultural nuances of Latinos and Latinas so that we can flip the script and use it for our benefit. And we're going to do this by learning from the former chief talent and diversity officer at Verizon. Let's go. Let's go. Bienvenidos. ¿Qué tal? What a great episode we're going to have today. What a guest. What a guest. I'm so excited that you said yes. It's Thank great to be here with both of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Magda. So, Magda, we're going to take some time to introduce you to the audience. So you're going to have to be patient because you are so accomplished that it's going to take us some time. So Magda recently retired from Verizon, where she was Senior Vice President of Strategic d and Initiatives and Supplier Diversity. There, she was also the Chief Talent and Diversity Officer. She serves as the Vice Chairperson of Aspira of New York, is on the Governing Board of Stonecrest Community Church, a trustee of Columbia Theological Seminary, an alumna Hall of Famer for the Hispanic Scholarship Fund and is part of the Cornell University Council. And she's been awarded and recognized for that. Magda has been part of the 50 Most Powerful Latinas by Alpha, named to People in Español 25 Most Powerful Women and Top Executive in Corporate Diversity by Black Enterprise. She's also a President's Award recipient from the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And if that wasn't enough, she was recently appointed a member of President Biden's Advisory Commission on Advancing Education, Equity, Excellence and Economic Opportunity for Hispanics. She has a blended family with three kids. Magda, you're a true trailblazer, a Hispanic star, and we're honored to have you today. Thank you. I'm the one that's honored to be here. Let's do this. Let's, Let's do, do this. It. Let's talk about you. When you and I spoke, you talked so much about your mom that I thought, what would be best than starting the conversation, learning about how you grew up, the influence that your mom had in you, especially in the context of how you manage your career. Can you tell us about her? Absolutely. My mom, uh, we talk about trailblazers. She was a trailblazer. A single mom of three came here from Puerto Rico and really showed us that she had great expectations of us and we needed to have them of ourselves. I think a few things that she also taught us that served me well from a career perspective was, you know, she was very much this blend of dualities, right? She was strong and she was humble. She was meek and she was bold. And I think that in our lives, right, we're multidimensional beings and so are others. And so I think that served me immensely well as I proceeded in my career. I think she also showed us that faith mattered, that we happened to be grounded in a Christian faith, but there was room for lack of judgment. Um, so she really had this awe of humanity and the potential of all people from all backgrounds. Mom saw you. She noticed you, and I think that has served me well as well. She taught us that we were to be servant leaders, that we were blessed, and that with blessing comes the opportunity to bless others. And something that was said all the time was, to whom much is given, much is expected. And I'll end with something that I think was also very useful to me and could be to others, and that was, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. And it was very important and we think about kindness and the lack of kindness and how easy it is to be polarized and to tear each other down. And when you show up in a place of peace in a professional context, you really can bring down the temperature. And we're going to find ourselves in complicated, complex discussions. And how do we show up in a way that brings peace into the room was something that I also learned from my mother. 
I love that. And it's incredible how you're like talking about duality of Latina moms. We should talk more about that. The capacity of my mom to compliment you, criticize you at the same time, yes. in the same sentence. She was like, yes. oh, this is wonderful. I wonder whether the kids are going to fall down. Oh, no, no, it's <laughs> true that Latina moms have yes. this duality. I yes. wish I would meet your mom. Great. Yeah. And we're going to talk about your faith in a little bit. I know our audience wants to understand how can somebody do a lot of things at the same time, juggle the life of the Latina woman. You were studying, working, and raising three kids. Can you tell us how did you do that? Well, you know, you use the word at the same time. And sometimes that's something we have to take time, pause, and consider. So I always believed that I could have everything, but maybe not all at the same time. And I had to define what everything meant to me. What was most important to me? What did I value? Not self-imposed, not what's on Twitter or Instagram, what's most important in the broader context. But to me, mm -hmm. it was very important that I obtain my education. It was very important that I maintain my career. And it was super important that I raised my children. And how do I do those things that are important to me as well as I can? And maybe not all equally well at the same time. And I had to come to terms with that for myself. I had to really apply the Aspira AAA process. So we talked about the fact that I am the vice chair of Aspira. I am an aspirante. I came up through the high school initiatives that really helped to ground me in the AAAs, and that was awareness, analysis, and action. And when I was in, going back to school, I had to pause and I had to say, like, hey, I have to build my awareness about all of the possibilities of how I'm going to do this, how it's going to affect and impact my family. There were choices I had to analyze, and then I had to take action, and I had to take that action in cooperation and in communication with my family. What does this mean for us? What are the expectations that are going to be shifting here? I had to be very comfortable with learning to say no and missing out on some things in my children's lives for the time being. So that could get a lot of guilt and condemnation coming up because you have to be perfect in every role that you play. And back to how do you define perfection? I had to really get comfortable with what was good enough so that I can truly take care of my children, take care of my career, advance my educational credentials. At that moment, I chose to do all of that at the same time. And that required support. So I had to also learn how to ask for help. I have an amazing husband and father of my children. And there were other people as well, paid support or church members, friends and family. It's cliche, but it takes a village. And we came together as a community, as a family. And that's really less about how special I am and most about how special the people around me were. And I think that it would be interesting to hear, you know, like your story and how did you multitask? Because if we can say something about Latinas is that we multitask. Yes. Um, we live in multi-generational families. We are the caregivers in many of the cases of our children, but also for our parents and our grandparents and the tias. And that comes with a price of actually our professional career in some instances. Hispanic women are significantly more likely than Hispanic men to limit their careers due to being working parents. But on top of being the caregivers, uh, we work actually in household hours by far more. So the question is, are there any tips that you can give to our audience in general about how to manage a multifaceted and full life career without challenging your career progression? And I'm asking you this because in your experience with DEI, you've managed a number of people and probably you have seen some best practices. Absolutely. I think it starts with surrounding yourself with the right people. And that includes the partner you choose. Now, with that said, yes, there are amazing demands um, that we're responding to. And I do believe that it comes with being able to just lighten up on some of our expectations. I will tell you that I might have had a dusty house, dustier than I may have liked. Or my kids didn't, you know, the pigtails weren't exactly where I would have put them had I combed 
the girl's hair as compared to my husband's. And so sometimes we have to let go of some of the standards that we have in order to minimize for ourselves. Because I think that for me, I have focused most on what I can control. I can control my husband far less than I can control myself. Therefore, if I lower my standards and I let go of some things that to the world are so important, like a clean house or a perfectly groomed child, chances are I can potentially help myself to free up time. And the multi-generational piece, you know, we talked earlier about me as a parent, but I also had my mother living with me for 12 years and caring for her. And so I had to, again, set limitations and boundaries and shift expectations on myself, on people around me, my siblings and, and other family, in order to really be able to make it work. Because the work's not going to go away, but you can redefine what's most important at the end of the day from a family perspective. I think from a corporate perspective, we certainly have to have the types of DEI initiatives that provide the right kind of support for working parents and particularly for working mothers. And so, you know, again, choosing wisely, who is your employer? What are the values of that employer? And what are the kinds of benefits that are going to support you as you think about child rearing, elder care, all of those things that we care deeply about and that we're not going to just table and put as not to be done, but rather how do I do these with the right levels of support? So I think that's, that's important. The policies, you have to look at the policies and programs of companies. I think um, employee resource groups are fantastic because they give a lot of sharing of ideas and tips and support, empathy, common shared experiences. But also the, the plain vanilla talent programs, really making sure that we are looking at the pipeline and saying, do we have enough Latinas in the pipeline for leadership? If we don't, what are the barriers? Is it indeed having to do with family and community? And how might we introduce the flexibility inside the workplace that allows for people to be successful? For Latinas who are carrying a, a great load, not only in their families, but in the communities that they serve, because Latinas are constantly saying yes um, to their nuclear family, the extended family, and then the larger community. And I think that that's one of the main reasons we needed to create this podcast, let alone we wanted to create is We needed to create this podcast is because I think that there's an incredible need for navigation guidance, for how to. How do I make it as a Latina to really reach the C-suite level that I want? Do I want to get there or does it scare me about the price that I have to pay and how if I am a company that is in absolute clear need to hire and to diversify their senior suite? How do I do it? You're a first generation college graduate. I think that 44% of Latinos are the first generation in a number of fronts where the 44% of Latinos are the first generation to graduate college. That is by far higher number than all the other groups. Although we're making a huge amount of progress, 73% more Latinos since the last 10 years have been able to graduate college. So that navigation becomes even more important. So the question will be, how did you do it without a navigation piece with a mother and living with you and the three children and a very challenging career? How did you do it? How did you get the advice or the mentorship uh, that you needed um, if your close circle was unable to do it because they couldn't, they didn't have the experience or the information, maybe sometimes not even the language? Well, I think that you start with acknowledging that everyone has wisdom. And so I think we often discount our close circle. So my mother may not have had the college education, but she had wisdom beyond anything I could have imagined. And so I think we need to start with our close circle, with our mama, with our tias, with those people who know us best. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they can see things that we can't even see. And I had such amazing advice from my mother that applied to my career, that applied to my, you know, graduate studies, that applied to everything. And I would encourage us to tap into the strength 
of our community and not to buy into the fact that perhaps they don't have a lot, a lot of insights and um, experiences that are going to serve us exceedingly well as we map out the steps that we take, whether it's college and career and parenting and all of these other things that are to follow. The second piece for me is there are resources that are available and equity is at the heart of the matter. Are we getting our fair share of the resources that exist? So whether it's in the high schools or in the colleges or in our companies, really being very knowledgeable about what exists, doing our homework, and availing ourselves of those opportunities against whatever barriers may present themselves. Si se puede, meterle ganas, and really forge through whatever those barriers are, because the resources generally are there. They're just not spread out equitably for people to gain the access that, that they need. And then lastly, outside of our institutions that we're a part of that have programs that we could take full advantage of is like, what's out there? What else? What external resources are out there? For me, Aspira was an amazing support for my mother to give information on details about college. You know, I had mentors that led me and helped me understand uh, the kinds of companies that would make sense for me. And so, you know, who are those external people? So start with the people that are closest to you, that know you well. They know a lot. Tap into the resources and make sure they are ed equitably available to you. And then, I mean, there's so much available to us by way of the internet to just access the resources and the people that may be a little bit further away. So let's talk about that further away, the networks. And we know that 40% of uh, the success of an entrepreneur, for example, depends on the networks they have. And we know that we're not the most connected. So if you think of our, our Latina, Uh, looking at us, at our 35-year-old, you know, like with a mama, una mama, una abuela, una tía that really want to give them their advice. But how, how, and they have all those ganas, huh? they are really willing. So what would be two or three pieces of advice that you would give to our younger Latinas? It's about being able to be in the room where it happens. Be a good student of the environment. You know your industry, know it well. Right? What are those trade associations? What are those groups of people that you need to make yourself a part of? I think we're not going to be invited. Right? If we're waiting for an invitation, if we're waiting for the cavalry to come across the hill and somehow save the day, it starts with, with ourselves really understanding if this is my industry, if this is my profession, If I am a, a female professional, if I'm a Latina, what are those networks that are, that are in place today that I am not a part of? And how do I begin to access them? And no, you may not start out, you know, at the very, very top of the organization in terms of establishing relationship, but wherever it is that you can gain access, create opportunity. Because nine times out of ten, somebody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. That's one thing. The second is be a good relationship, not builder, but keeper. Right? Care about the people that you meet. Stay in touch with them. Don't only shoot high at the people that you perceive to have all of the access, although over time you want to have enough of them on your short list as well. But you certainly want to, if, if, you know, call people not only when you need them. Keep in touch with them. There's an interesting article that you see that's an industry article that you think, hey, somebody, you know, send it forward to that person. Become somebody that is now a little bit more top of mind than you would have been. And that relationship gets stronger. And um, those are a couple of things that I would tell a Latina that, um, you know, is starting to form uh, a network is, you know, start with the access that you have, be a good student of your industry and of your company, of the environment, and then build from there by being a really good relationship keeper um, as much as it is that you're dedicated to building 
the network, but keeping it, Correct. nurturing it. And also, the network doesn't have to be only with Latinas, right? Like Absolutely. We have to have mentors and sponsors that are women of any color, men. Absolutely. Otherwise, the progress will be too slow. If Cynthia, we have to. that is an important point. And there's something I learned from Magda, actually, that it comes from network. And she is a Latina that opens doors for other Latinas. The amount of doors you opened for me when I was starting in this world made me realize that we need to do that. Open the door for each other. Don't elbow each other, support each <laughs> other, buy from each other, like introduce to each other. Because more, the more connections you give, the more connections you get. Absolutely. So now we want to talk about your career. You spent over 30 years at Verizon, right? Talk about the, not the 1%, the 0.001% of people that start their career in Verizon end up in the C-suite of Verizon, right? It's a big company. How did you do it? How did you get promoted? Like, can you give us some tips on how to raise your hand, get noticed and become that 1%, 0.1% that gets to the top? You know, the, you can't jump over the basic fundamentals of meeting and exceeding objectives. You, know, you want to be someone who understands what's expected of you, meet those expectations, and maybe even look at things that are adjacent and possibly, you know, just continue to be someone that is seen as a go-to person in your organization. Now, there's a caveat. You don't want to just be that person that everybody is going to for more and more and more because, like Claudia was saying, we love to raise our hand. We love to care for a lot of things. But you do have to meet those basic expectations and try to see, is there some way that I could actually exceed it and shine a little bit here? And never underestimate your supervisor and your peers. We were just talking about networking, and I have seen many... Uh, time where people just are so into building their network that they forget the very basics of their performance and why they are there on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have to keep that in balance. And your supervisor and your peers, not just your supervisor, but your supervisor and your peers will be asked about you when you're not in the room. And so you really want to be able to have the kind of brand and reputation with your supervisor and your peers that they would say, positive things uh, about you. I think you also need to be a really good student of the environment that you find yourself in. Who are the key players? How do they move? How do they behave? In some ways, it will be distasteful and disingenuous to your core values, and you say, huh, that's good to know. I don't want to be that way. Um, or it would be, huh, how, how do I continue to observe and watch this person and maybe even connect with this person so that I can learn and continue to grow? And I think that you also need to be willing to use your voice for yourself. Claudia talked about using your voice for others and how important that is. You have, I think that might be easier for us as Latinas to use our voice for other people because we tend to be generous and community-minded we tend to see using our voice for ourselves as lacking humility. And humility is a value often in our community. And so I think we have to find our voice in the right way and not think that hard work by itself and all these other things that I may have mentioned by themselves. And so for me, on a couple of occasions, I had to lean in and say, what about me? Is there something that's lacking? think that feedback is a gift. Yeah. And a lot of times supervisors hold back feedback that might serve us really well because they think it could hurt our feelings, it could demotivate us. But you want that kind of feedback. You want feedback that says, I know when I woke up today, I am not perfect. I believe I'm pretty darn great. But is it possible that there's something between who I am today and who I can be tomorrow and in my future? that you could share with me and really open that environment so that people know that for real, you want the feedback because you're about growing and improving on yourself and you create that kind of an environment for all kinds of people, for mentors, for your boss, for um, people in your network to really feel safe to help you be your best you. I think that is extremely important as well. I mean, I would like to 
take the last few minutes of what you said and take a time machine and give myself yes. this advice because I wish somebody had told me these things, you know, I was pretty unaware. I didn't know how were decisions being made. So I hope that the audience finds this uh, useful and insightful. Okay, let's talk about your faith. So religion and faith is an important part of who we are and our values, but sometimes we don't share that. And there's this movement more and more to bring your whole self to work. I was so, so surprised when you and I spoke and you told me that you don't shy away from talking about your faith and that your faith is actually part of, of uh, your source of resilience at work. So can you tell us about that? Absolutely. Thanks for that question. It was earlier in my career a little bit taboo And this conversation about bringing your whole self and being authentic is part of a newer conversation in corporate America. And so I want to just be very transparent that it, it was a journey for me to find a way to bring my faith into the workplace in a way that was inclusive, in a way that respected and honored the fact that I had a particular perspective on faith that could be very different from others all the way to an atheist. And and how do we honor all of those differences? And so really, I just benefited from working for a company that was very committed to telling our story, the full story. And that was such a core part of my story that I felt very comfortable. And you have to know the environment in which you're working. And you have to always show up with your faith in a way that honors the faith of others. We're not there to convert people. We're there, as I said earlier, to create a place where we're all human, to coin one of yes. <laughs> you know, the experiences. But we are. And the beauty of faith is to be peace and to be love and to be um, gracious and, and generous and and to create that environment around you. So I, I really was able to anchor into that. Um, I'm a cancer survivor, and during that time, I was able to really just, in my place of work, um, express myself in a way that um, was meaningful, was real, mm -hmm. and was faith-based. Uh, when we talk about my mother, I can't talk about my mother and not express faith. And so if there are parts of yourself that you have to cover up or or leave behind and not be able to give your full story, then the company, the organization loses a lot of the potential impact that that person can have simply by just being genuine. Talking about not being able to be your full self in a situation how detrimental that is. 76% of Latinos cannot be themselves at the workplace. So you have to leave your true self at home and you come to work with someone you don't even know. So if you're Jorge, you come to work and you pretend to be George and you put yourself down and fly low so that you don't get into trouble because being your authentic self is associated with a con as opposed to a pro. And I think that that's such a shame for everybody. It's such a shame for the self because what happens to you if you have to repress who you are, you start actually losing touch with the environment where you are. You start disenfranchising and therefore probably being less effective at your workplace. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a shame for companies because honestly, if, if there's another organization that says like, hi, you can be yourself here. Come here. We welcome you here. You can be Jorge here. You can be Maria here. You don't have to pretend. You can be your loud self, your passionate self. The likelihood is we're going to go. How do we turn them around so that instead of being, oh, you're so loud, so passionate, how do we turn them around so that they can become leadership characteristics? What could be a great framework of using our cultural nuances and turn them into, you know, like into a place where it can help in your career ladder to be Maria, to be Jorge. It can help you having your uh, passion and your familismo and the respect for your elders. You covered it, quite <laughs> frankly. Yeah. That's, that's how, you know, show up being yourself, not covering. And if you're showing up and you are saying, I am about familia, and oh, by the way, here at work, I'm going to build family. That's going to make you an immense team builder. That's going to make you a great leader. That's not only going to make you able to lead your teams, but because you have that familia view, 
you will naturally complement other teams. You will naturally collaborate with other teams because you're not naturally, I don't want to say we're not competitive. We are competitive in a healthy way, in a familiar community way that believes that we can all rise together. And that for me to be my best doesn't have to break you down, but rather that as family, wouldn't it be lovely if my team and your team and that team all were able to be elevated, right? And I think that that is an example of a way that we could show up tapping into something that's a strength. I think when you say respect for authority, there it's kind of like we're pretty clear on the objectives of the team. You know, what is it that I'm here to do? And I'm going to focus on being able to meet those expectations. I think that is an absolute core value that we have that is not respect for authority mindlessly, but with a respect and regard for the fact that we collectively have something to do together. And I respect the fact that we have different roles that we play. And I don't have to play every role because in familia, everybody's role matters. Right. And so I think that we can absolutely leverage that as a, as a strength in our, in our community. Um, progress in corporate America or outside of corporate America, because I think that we are the growing, right? Population of entrepreneurs. And it is possible that the corporate structure that has been perceived as, right? The holy grail of success is not that. And there might be other ways that we can find that place where I can be Magda Irisari and I don't have to be Magda Irisari or whatever it is that, you know, seems to cloak us in terms of how we show up because I've chosen another path. And that's okay, too. And I think that our community needs to really be very mindful of expanding the possibilities for what success can look like for our community. And that, yes, does include getting a seat at the corporate table or at the board table. It also you know, includes entrepreneurship. I think that college is definitely a path forward. But as we're looking at the shifts in corporate America and in many of the hiring bodies in the United States and around the globe, skill-based you know, hiring is very important. So how do we know how to package ourselves with the skills that we have and not always believe that it's the most traditional credentialing that's required um, for success? And I think that we're just very curious people. We believe, you talked about that hope, that optimism. And so for us to be contagious, in our organizations. I don't know that we have to have the loudest voice to be perceived or to truly be the most passionate in the room. And so how do we define passion in a way that's real and authentic to ourselves um, and meaningful to the organizations that we choose to either lead or become a part of? And I would like to just like get deeper. I would love to know more about like uh, what are the misconceptions that you think that corporate America can be made aware of and what are the things that Latinas could be made aware of about their characteristics in this, uh, in this spectrum of flipping the script. It's interesting to hear flip the script. And one of the things that I think is in the script that we have to challenge or question or have some conversation around is, is there one Latina profile? And we are very diverse as well. And so as Latinas, there are Latinas who, you know, my, my daughter's a Latina. She's very different. Her lived experience is very different from mine, as was my mother's experience from mine. And so I think that one of the things that starts to happen, and I don't know if either of you have experienced this, is we start to almost measure each other's Latinaness. And that could come in the way of something that you talked about earlier that's really powerful, Claudia, which is how we support each other. So it's kind of like if you don't speak Spanish, you're not, you know, Latina enough. Latina enough. <laughs> For example, um, and what, you know, and I think that we're coming, you know, in a multi generational mix of Latinas that I think if we want to be able to be that generation that pulls the next generation or grabs hold of the generation before, we're going to have to embrace the fact that it's very different. Um, as each of us have been either part of the United States for a longer time or, or have a, just a different set of experiences in our background. So I just want to put that out there to anybody who's listening, 
that we all need to be just mindful yeah. of, of that sense of belonging. Even in our own communities, I'm finding that to be a necessary part of it. We're a very diverse, you know, whether it's national origin, economic status, you know, all, all kinds of reasons why we would be somewhat different and something that I think needs to be part of the conversation. The way that I think that we turn some of the misconceptions into strengths is if we really show up authentically. The misconceptions will continue if we don't show and demonstrate that this is what passion is. This is what being community-minded looks like. This is what you will gain if I am able to be who I am. Right? And I think that we have bought into perhaps needing to leave the Jorge behind for the George perhaps. And I do believe there has been a time in our history and even today in certain environments where that unfortunately may continue to be a person's experience. I would say to that person, that's not where you belong. It is clear to me after 30 some odd years that I get to choose where I give my allegiance, where I give my sweat equity, mm -hmm. I would choose. Sometimes for my mother, she didn't have the same choices, unfortunately. And today there are a lot of people who don't have the same choices. Okay, so I don't want to, not Pollyanna. Well, when we do have the choice, do not choose to be anyone other than who you really are. Do not choose to stay. You get to pick your employer as much as your employer gets to pick you. And often when we're first generation and that first job and right, that, that first income is so tempting. Ask yourself about the cultural norms of that organization. It really, really matters. And sometimes we have to take that first job because we've got to have that breakthrough. But in the back of your mind, you have to define, how long will I stay here? Why am I here? What am I going to get out of this experiment here so that I can gain everything, right, that I need and give everything? It's a reciprocal relationship. I'm working here. I will give my best and I will take we're good givers. We give, 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 give. And there's almost like this, this taste with saying, I take. But we have to reap and sow, reap and sow. And that's okay. And it's okay. You are still loyal. If you choose to leave, you are still loyal. So sometimes there's that voice in our head, that loyalty thing. And the reality is, you get paid a day's pay for a day's work. And every single day you maintain that reciprocal loyal relationship, but you have never been asked to give your future to anyone. And so you have to be discerning and make sure that you are in the kind of environment that's not toxic to you and that is disloyal to you and your, community. and your community. Because Latinas, we have to yes. support each other. So this is so powerful. I just want to make sure that the, you know, like I, we, we, we cement this. We need to understand who we are and show authentically, but we need to be aware of how to flip the script. To build on flipping the script, one thing that I'm seeing right now in corporate America is that because of the working from home like, or more flexible mm. working environments, I think the, the people are understanding that there's not necessarily a correlation between being busier and being less effective at work because there used to be this idea that you had to be on your desk. So if you have family, if you're raising kids, if you're taking care of a parent, maybe you can't be the first person in the office, the last person right. in the office. But now you don't necessarily have to be in the office all the time. And I heard once, and I do believe it's true, that if you want something done, you ask for that to the busiest person. Like busy people just get things done. And I think 
we Latinas, and you can see us, like <laughs> you too, we're all really busy and here we are recording this podcast, right? I think if we can flip the script and say, yes, Latinas are very busy, but we get more done than anyone else. It, it Instead of saying we're very busy, so we can't really commit to work. Like there's the yeah. flipping of the script there too, I think. Yeah, I think that being busy... I've been asked that question. How do you, with all of the things, I said, well, I prioritize. I prioritize because that busyness can be all-consuming. And one of the things that, you know, if I had to give advice to my younger self, it would be that busy can be a four-letter word. And that what that does can be very destructive to us personally. And so that busy piece, you are absolutely right. We are those multitaskers. We are busy and people will come to us because they know we have capacity, right? And my advice to myself and to others is manage that four-letter word because um, everything is not equally important just because it's urgent. Everything's not equally important just because it's important to somebody else. Be mindful of who it's important to. Don't just do what you like to do, but see who the, the power brokers are and what are they saying is most important and help that to help you prioritize as long as it's not outside your value set. Uh, but I think that busy piece for me was to really prioritize myself, to prioritize personal time to prioritize wellness. I think everything we needed to learn, we learned in kindergarten about, you know, playing and sharing and eating well and exercise. If you think about it, you could do any kind of exercise plan as long as you stick to it, it'll work. You could do any kind of diet plan as long as you stick to it, it would work. Um, but it is the inconsistency of wellness. And so that would be Big advice to myself as I think about that in the context of busy and, and wellness. Um, and how do we just make sure that we take care of our health? So throughout this season, Claudia and I are hoping to have a list of 10 things that Latinas can use as their playbook to climb the ladder. And we have our first list and we want to test it with our guests. Can you help us either confirm or debunk one of them? The question is, is it true that to climb the ladder, we have to be the first one in, the last one out, and not try to build your career based on being smarter, but actually build it based on working hard and have the reputation that you're really hard worker? You need the reputation that you're super smart. You need the reputation that you are working smart and not just working hard. The first in, first out depends on the nature of your position. Some people have to be the first one in because of the reports that they pull and they have to be the last one out because it has to be functionally verified, okay? Otherwise, you negotiate with your boss what makes sense for you and for your team and for the work and for your family. And so that first in, first out, I don't want to say is not necessary. It really is job dependent and most of us don't have to be, but um, it really should be negotiated. That whole work hard has nothing to do with being first in and last out. I mean, in my career, I had many a difficult conversation because I was on the operations team and there were certain people that had to pull certain reports, like at 7 a.m. they had to be there. Well, at 7 a.m. I was dropping my kids off you know, and making my way on a one you know, hour and a half commute. And so I had to really be able to say to this person and to my boss, um, his job requires 7 a.m. Mine doesn't. And therefore, I need to stop this conversation. It is not helpful. And so having your voice is really important. And that's part of the working smart. How do you have those conversations with your manager, with yourself, with your spouse, with your kids, about what work is going to look like. And, um, and it's, it's not necessarily about being first and, and, and last. And smart, um, you want an athlete on your team. You want someone who can go left, who can go right, because 
the dynamic environment in which we work requires highly adaptable people. And if I had to say about the Latino community, I think we know adversity and we know adaptation very, very well. And so I think we need to lean in to that. And that is really a smart thing. Like what is necessary here now, why? Right? Going back to the AAA process, right? Really build your awareness, analyze the options, and then take action, right? And it's the same thing with how you work smart. And um, I think that is really going to be the differentiator, that person that can ebb and flow, lean in, be there early when it's necessary, stay late when it's necessary, but knowing how to define what's really necessary and adapting to the requirements. And again, you may have to choose that the requirements of that role or of that organization is not for you. It's not for you. It's not for your family. Or maybe it's not for you and your family now. Timing matters, um, but really being smart about it. In our podcast, we want to make sure that we can address the how to do it, the playbook on um, how can Latinas uh you know, like succeed in corporate America and do it a la Latina. Success a la Latina, leadership a la Latina, being authentic to who we are, not copying other communities. So who do you think we, could, we should have in the podcast as a, as a guest, a special guest that can inspire Latinas and share their experience? Well, besides the two of you who I hope will be interviewed no, no, at we were some point be in time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Angeles Borrego, at Verizon is someone who is a leader in the finance organization. And what I love about Angeles is that she has learned how to balance the corporate demands with her commitment to community. I think that um, I have two peers who have recently retired, Nelly Borrero and Miriam Hernandez. Miriam was with KPMG and Nelly with Accenture. I think those three would be worth having a conversation with. Great, three for one. All right, <laughs> thank you. Naida, thank you so very much. Muchísimas gracias por tu sabiduría, por tu honestidad, por tu corazón, for your wisdom. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to say thank you, but more I want to say, where have you been all my life? <laughs> Why didn't I meet you before? <laughs> I feel the same way. Thank you, You know Magda. what? There's never remorse, only tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> Let's succeed a la Latina. Thank you, a la Latina. <laughs>